Hey guys, it's Mike Monty, one half of Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast. And we want to reach out to all the fans out there who have supported our show to say thank you. Thank you for making 2021 one of our best years. And one of our best years was because of Anchor. Anchor, the way that you can have your voice heard. You can be just like us. Record your own podcast. Use the Anchor tools to edit your podcast. Use it on a phone. Use it on your computer. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. And best of all with Anchor, they're totally free. So be jealous just like Long Island's number one pro wrestling broadcast, Monty and the Pharaoh. We're looking together for a great 2022. We've got huge guests coming on board. Oh, yeah. You probably wonder why Jimmy's not here right now. Well, he's prepping for one of the best interviews we're about to have and we're going to surprise someone with. So hang aboard with us and don't forget, be like us and use Anchor. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first episode of SOB Sports with your wrestling legends, Mike Halick, formerly known as Mantar, and Paul New, formerly known as the Rap Master PN News. Without further well, ado, here are your hosts, Paul New and Mike Halick. What's up, everybody? How's everybody out there in podcast land today, man? As Tim said, I'm Mike. And there's my partner, Paul, and we can't tell you how grateful and thankful we are here at SOB Sports to finally get this venture kicked off the ground. We're going to have a great story today. You know, I'd like to first I'd like to give a shout out to Monty and the Pharaoh and Tim Beal for collaborating on this venture, man, and getting this off the ground. And we're going to have a lot of fun today, everybody. Paul, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, that's right, Mike. I really want to thank these guys, too. Universal, uh, Tim Beal, and Monty and the Sparrow. This is going to be a great venture. I am looking so effing forward to getting this venture off the ground. We're going to do a lot of exciting stuff over the next few months and years, and uh, we're going to make everybody that's listening to this podcast happy, and they're going to go about their day, and they're going to feel a little bit better about themselves after they've had a laugh with me and my partner, Mike. Ooh. 
Ooh. Let's give the first match our roar, everybody. That's what I'm talking about. You know, yo, uh, baby, yo, so, baby, yo, yo, baby, yo, baby, yo. So tell me, bro, how did you sleep last night, man? Did you sleep good? Did you get a good night's rest? Dude, I had visions of sugar plum fairies, and they all had your face on them, man. It was fantastic. <laughs> like you no, said, like a night. big fat baby, man. Uh, I had a great time. I was, uh, yeah, I slept pretty good. You know me and Mike. I'm not a really great sleeper, but it, it felt it felt pretty good. I was really excited about uh, starting this venture today. I mean, I saw you posted it on Facebook. I posted it uh, earlier today, and uh, we've had a quite a bit of. Uh, traction on that so uh, everything's looking good buddy yeah man same here brother so without further ado man let's get this show on the road so what i want to lead off with here today is i want to let everybody out there know who we are how we got hooked up together why everybody's calling us brothers and cousins and sisters you know i want to i want to put it out there for everybody so we could pi- finally put all this shit to rest, man, because I'm tired of hearing the fucking question all the time. Hey, is, uh, what's up with your buddy, uh, your brother, uh, Pia News? And I'm like, man, that's not my brother. But, you know, if you say so, what's up with your cousin, Pia? Man, it's not my cousin, man. And I get tired of hearing that fucking shit. So maybe after today, we won't have to hear that crap anymore. Well, you know what? We don't have to, Mike. And I'll tell you what, I'll tell you how we can sort the problem out. Let's get right into it. And like, why don't you tell everybody how this came about? Because it started on your end when you met my brother, John New. I want you to yeah. start. With yeah. So, so, so remind me again, what year was it that you were hot on WCW? Was it, it 90- was 91, 92? Yeah, no, it was 1991, man, is when I was hot on the WCW at the time. Okay. So 1991, everybody. Um, I just spent 11 months in training camp in Tampa, Florida with Larry Malenko. He was formerly known as the great Boris Malenko. Um, his son, Dean Malenko, the man of a thousand holds, and his other son, Jody Malenko. So I spent 11 months in Florida training and um, learning the job. And I came back to Omaha, Nebraska, and I was home for about a month. And a buddy called me up and said, hey, uh, Slim, you want to go out and have a couple beers? I said, sure. So. We met at this bar and about 10, 15 minutes into the, having a couple beers, man, we're standing there. And my buddy says, hey, man, why is this guy peacocking you? I was like, man, I don't know, but he fucking sure is staring pretty hard. And I said, if you don't knock that shit out, I'm going to go over there and fucking knock his ass out. And um, he was like, yeah, man. And so this guy could obviously tell that we were getting a little angry and shit because he's over there fucking staring at us, man. I mean, staring a fucking hole right through you. And uh, he comes over and he says, hey, fellas, he says, how's it going, man? He says, he says, listen, man, he says, um, I'm sorry for staring at you guys, he says, but I'm trying to fucking figure out why my brother is in this bar and not coming over and saying hello to me. And I was like, mm, your brother, huh? He's like, yeah, my brother. I says, I suppose your brother is PN News, the rap master. And the only reason I said that is because at the time, you were super smoking hot on WCW TV. I just came out of training camp, and I had aunts and uncles from all over the United States calling my mom and dad and saying, hey, Marsha, hey, Bob, is that Mike on TV, man? He looks fucking great. And they was like, no, man, he just got back from Florida. So <laughs> so I'd seen you work on, on TV a couple times, and, and so that's what it came. I said, so I suppose you're going to tell me your brother's PN News, the rap master. He was like, absolutely, yes, I am. I said, man, now I'm really fucking going to knock you. I'm going to knock your ass out twice. Once for fucking lying to me and once for staring. He was like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. He's reaching in his back pocket and he grabs out his license. He says, look, he says, here's my license. He says, my name's Johnny New. His name is Paul New. And he says that our mom and dad own new cheese up in Hardington, Nebraska. And I was like, fucking incredible, man. What are the chances of this, man? So we fucking hugged it out, man, and had a fucking couple beers. We tried to call your fat ass, but you didn't answer. And um, you end up returning my yeah. Well, you end up you know returning my phone call. Thank goodness, a week or so later. And um, and you know you asked me. You said, "Hey, uh, I hear we look a lot alike." And I was like, "Yeah, according to all my family, yes, we do." And at that time, bro, you have to admit, me and you could have been twins. 
Yeah, we could have been. You know, I just want to add, like, I remember talking to my brother, John, and he said, God, I met this guy. You really need to, you need to talk to him, you know. He puts you over like a million dollars, man. I don't know. I mean, I know he's not gay, so I know nothing nefarious went on. So, uh, but, uh, you know, so John's a great businessman. He's, he's got his, he's got a couple of businesses up there in Yankton, South Dakota. I'm very proud of his little, little buddy and stuff like that. He's got a wonderful family. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but John was, uh, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was so excited. And then when I finally did get to see, talk to you and then I met you and, and, and I mean, dude, we did look exactly like our faces and stuff like that. Our bodies were a little bit different, but you can't have everything. Right. But, no, uh, you, sure you know, can't, man. no. And then, and then I think we went up to, where was it? We ended up going up to uh, Sioux city. We started up in Sioux city and we ended up. Yeah. In you, you asked me. Yeah, city, you call- and I work with, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, you came up to Sioux city. You drove up yourself to Sioux city. And I think we, I was on with one man gang that night in Sioux City, Iowa. I had like busloads of people come out of Hardington, just like 60 minutes up the road and busloads of people. So, I mean, that's that, that, uh, what is it? The civic hall there in Sioux City. Dude, that was a well, civic center. You know, I don't know. I don't know if you remember this, but at the end of the trip, you asked me if I could give a couple boys a ride back to Omaha. And it was Robert yeah. Gibson and the Junkyard Dog. Now, right. you remember you remember going to the hood and looking for some crack for JYD. I don't remember it. I don't remember it, but I mean, I mean, but I can imagine that JYD was looking for some shit. So, so let me. So here's how it ran down. So we're like 15 minutes out of town, and and JYD says, "Hey, Mikey says, um, the only place where we can get some fucking crack around here." And I was like, "Crack?" I was like, "Well, fuck, JYD. I always smoke weed, so I don't know what the fuck you're on about." He said, but I'm sure we could find some in the hood. He said, let's go to the hood, man. He says, let me meet my fellow brothers in crime. And so we drive to the fucking hood, man. I flagged this fucking guy down. He comes over. He said, hey, man, can we get 200? Because JYD wanted 200 hours with the crack. He says, can we get 200 hours with the crack? The guy says, man, he says, what do you think? You guys are a bunch of cops, man. You think I'm holding 200 hours with the crack on me? I'm standing on the fucking street corner. Are you nuts? And we said, listen, man, we got the money. JYD said, here's the money. He says, um, he said, he looks in the car. He says, where do I know you from? To JYD. JYD said, I don't know. Uh, you tell me. He says, you're the one that brought it up. He's like, man, I've seen you somewhere before. I know I have, man. And, and, and uh, JYD says, well, he says, you ever watch professional wrestling? He says, yeah. As a matter of fact, he says, Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, you JYD, JYD, so man, here, man, asking me to buy some fucking crap. And he said, uh, he says, I'll tell you what, man, he says, let me just run to my dealer real quick. You guys drive around the fucking block and come back in five minutes, man, and I'll have it for you. So that's what we did, man. We drove around the fucking block and um, got the fucking 200 hours with the crack, and we fucking went back to the fucking hotel, and JYD and fucking Robert Gibson fucking did 200 hours of fucking crack. I fucking said goodnight to Paul. I fucking went home and slept in my bed. And all I could think about was, you know what? man. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Those two guys, uh, both JYD and Rob Gibbs, are just a, a good time. You know, a good guys to hang out with. Regardless yeah. of what their, uh, regardless of what their habits were, they were just great to be around, man. You know what I mean? They were. They just, were. They were a, great, a great workers, so, right? I mean, oh, I mean, great God, workers. Yeah. I mean, JYD was, was, was he like the first African-American to hold the belt in WCW, right? No, that was uh, Ron Simmons, dude. Oh, was it Ron Simmons? Okay. Ron, Sim- Ron Simmons, man. I love that. Yeah. Guy, dude. Damn. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, Ron was a great guy, man. I uh, No, but JYD was good. I mean, you could always have a good time. Robert Gibson and Ricky Morton. Ricky Morton, all she's saying to me, goes, man, I ain't slept since 1983. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man, it was it was a great time that weekend, man. I met uh, Dick Murdoch for the first time, met Dusty Rhodes for the first time, met a lot of first timers. You know, I, I met a lot of a lot of prof- old school pro wrestlers uh, back yeah. in the day, man, when I was like 10, 11 years old. Uh, Mad Dog Vashon was uh, my neighbor, lived just two blocks over the hill. And so he used yeah. to give my dad was a mailman. He used to give my dad free tickets to the show at the Civic Auditorium. And we go down there and, and watch him wrestle. And then after the first match, my dad would take me down to the curtain. We'd ask for Mad Dog. Maurice would come, pick me up, 
and it took me in the back. And I remember the first time I was like uh, 10 and Maurice takes me back there. And the very first person he introduces me to is Andre the Giant, right? And he was like, knocked on his fucking door. He was like, boss, boss, I have someone here who wants to meet you. I think he can take you. And Andre opens the door and he, he says, yeah, come on in. So we sat in. I remember I shook his hand, man. His fucking hand. And I got big hands, man. Look at the size of them fucking mitts. Andre's hands were three times the size of my hands, man. He totally engulfed my fucking hand, and I was just like, oh, my God. And I was standing there, and he's sitting in a chair, and I'm still looking up at his big ass, right? I was like, this hey, fucker's Mike, huge. Mike, can I, Mike yeah. can I cut you off? I think we're having a sure. mic issue with you. I don't think uh, Tim's getting you on the mic. And I also wanted to just uh, add the fact that uh, JYD was the first black wrestler to hold the Mid-South World Championship belt for uh, Mid-South Territory. That I believe that was... Uh, What's his name? Watts at the time. I believe that was Watts. Bill Watts. Nice, so, man. Can you can you yeah, hear me okay? Yeah. M and J video games and collectibles, sport and non-sport cards, wrestling items, autographed items. We buy, sell, and trade. M and J video games and collectibles, located at 1049 Queen Street, Southington, Connecticut. Call us at 1-860-479-9223 or 86093games M and J video games and collectibles episode 1 of SOB Sports Network with your host wrestling legends Mike Halick formerly known as Mantar and Paul New formerly known as the Rap Master PN News so we're talking about junkyard dog so we, we left off talking about Junkyard Dog and him going into the ghettos of Mississippi and Louisiana purchasing crack cocaine, which I knew about. But it was, uh, actually, it was the first first. <laughs> But I wanted to say something, and I'll let you guys turn it back over. Junkyard Dog was the first black Mid-South World Wrestling heavyweight champion Yes. which predated Ron Simmons' win in WCW <clears throat> probably by about seven years. But you yeah, guys have the floor. No, was, we were, we'll we were, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, but I, we were talking about WCW. Ron Simmons was the first WCW heavyweight world champion. I, I did know about JYD doing that because that was for Bill Watts down there in those days. It was, But that's that's a good call. Please do that stuff. I, I don't know if Mike gets it, but I see that on my screen. And so anytime you're doing any kind of searching like that, that, you know, that that's going to help us out hundred percent. Tim. Yeah. Well, I, I knew that, I knew that JYD was the first uh, African-American to be the champion somewhere. So at least I was half fucking right. You know? Um, but yeah, man, that first, that first weekend um, hanging out with you, bro, was a lot of fun, you know, Beating Dick Murdoch, you know, Dusty Rhodes, uh, Sting, all the boys, right, before I had a chance to work with any of them was absolutely incredible. And um, so fast forward a little bit. So you and I continue talking after we first meet up for the first weekend and spent 72 hours together. And we kept talking on the phone and you sent me this message. You said, hey, you want to go to Germany and learn the job, fat guy? And I was like, well, yeah, I'm game. And so you said, well, let me call the promoter, Otto Vance, because I've been working over there. And you called Otto. Otto loves big guys, you told me. And you got me the first gig in Germany for the CWA and Otto Vance um, right back in 92. And it was a blast, man. And I remember you, you told me, you said, Chubbs, whatever you do, just tell him you've been working for two years. I was like, okay, bro, you got it, man. So I fly across the pond, and we had a workout session, maybe one or two. There was me and the champ, and and the champ second, my second day, Finley. And um, we went through the stuff, and I was a great amateur at that time. And I originally started training in Eddie Sharkey's training camp up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, but he really wasn't teaching me anything. Um, 
So I, I transferred down to Malenko's camp for 11 months. And so I pretty much got by that training session by the skin of my pants. And they said, how long have you been working? I said, two years. And obviously what we worked out, they believed me that I was wrestling for two years. And so I'm thinking I'm safe, man. So championship night comes, Saturday night comes, the place is full, like eight, 9,000 people. And I'm out there and I'm shitting my pants because – this is my first fucking professional wrestling match ever. And, I mean, I start fucking hyperventilating, man. I was sweating. I totally forgot about everything that we talked about already. And I haven't even locked up with the guy, right? And so, uh, is my mic still there? Yeah, you're just moving around so much. We're yep, struggling here. You. Okay, so. Uh, you need a body shop? You need engine repair? Auto Excellence, Collision Specialist, 631-261-6420. That's 631-261-6420, Auto Excellence. You know, he loved your amateur background as well. You know, because you have that amateur background, that was huge. That was that's huge for Otto. You know what I mean? He likes he likes big athletes. Otto himself was a was an ex boxer. You know. So, oh wow! Uh, yeah, you didn't know that. Okay. No, yeah, I had yeah, no he idea. So he told so me stories me... about meeting Arnold Schwarzenegger and stuff like that because they grew up in the same area. But go yeah. ahead. Yeah, so so listen, I heard a story about Otto Bonds. I don't know if it's true or not, but when he was in AWA, I heard that he paid Vern like fifty or a hundred thousand for that championship belt. Is that true? Um, yeah, he paid a lot of money. I think it was about fifteen fifteen thousand uh, Deutschmark, so about ten grand to to win that belt, so that he could go back to to uh, Germany with that title in Austria. Because it just it, it made it look good, and then it also got him into Japan because the AWA champion was going over to Japan and working for New Japan. So it it, it gave Otto that worldwide push, and uh, and it, you know it just made him look better. I mean, Austria is a country of eight million people. You know what I mean? The guy was a superstar. He, you know, I, I'm I'm sure they've got a statue to him somewhere down there in Graz. I mean, that yeah, I mean. He was two tons of fun, that guy, and doing those roam ups. You remember getting hit with a roam up, I'm sure. <laughs> well, yeah, well, but I there's heard a funny that. story. Hold on a second. There's a really funny story about him in the AWA. So they're down in Phoenix, Arizona, right? And the ring that they were using, because they didn't carry the ring all over the country, the AWA, they used local promoters' rings. So when, when they got there, this ring is like really, really tall. And uh, you couldn't, you know, an athlete could jump up into it, but Otto's not no. that big of an athlete. <laughs> so, and it, and it was a, it was a Royal Rumble or a Battle Royal that night, right? So it was a Battle Royal, and the champion gets introduced last. Well, for all the other guys, there was a chair beside the ring for everybody to get up in the ring, and Otto was wearing those uh, leather hoses, right? <laughs> so, so, so he's a, he's a champion at the time, so he's the last guy to get called down to the ring and somebody had moved the chair. One of the boys got the the, the uh, science to move the chair out of the way. And he couldn't get in the fucking ring with those letter hosing on. <laughs> so some of the a bunch of the wrestlers had to get out and help him get back up into the Push ring. Push his ass in, right? Get in there. I, I didn't fucker. I, I'm hearing that story secondhand, but I thought it was just it's just hilarious because I've seen auto break chairs, fall through floors. Oh, for fun's sake. I, I've, seen some, I've seen some funny stuff with that big man. You know what I mean? God rest his soul. But talking about that, I mean, Jerry Jarrett, did you spend any time uh, working for the Jarretts, Mike? No, not at all. Did you know Jerry or, or Jerry? You, you work with Jeff, right? Yeah, I, I worked with Jeff in the WWF, but that's as far as my affiliation goes with the Jarrett family, right? Well, I just know that Jerry, Jerry passed away just recently. I was just wondering if you uh, had any affiliation with him at all. I mean, God rest his soul. I mean, he was a great promoter. And, you know, his kid has, has done a lot of great things in the business. Uh, I'm not saying whether everybody likes the personality or anything like that, but 
but uh, you got to admit the you know the Jared family has uh, been around the block a time or two in, in the industry, don't you think? Oh yeah, they've definitely cemented their name in the history of professional wrestling, um, and a lot of a lot of great people have you know, and that's what's so good about the sport is someone always paved the way for you, and it was your job to after you made your mark on the sport to turn it over to some of the younger guys, you know, and that's something I really you know I I don't watch a lot of wrestling on TV today. Uh, because me, it's it's too gimmick gimmicky. It's too um, for entertainment excuse purposes me, excuse only. Me, excuse me, excuse me. Are you saying that Antar and PM News weren't gimmicky? Well, yeah. I mean, we were gimmicky, but we were four hundred fucking pounds, and at least you believed what we were doing, right? Yeah, you and that would be four hundred pounds of gimmick in itself, right? Well, you got you got these guys out there that weigh a buck seventy five or buck eighty. And they're flying around like a fucking bunch of acrobats. That's not fucking professional wrestling. You know, anybody can go in there and do that shit. Well, I don't know. I don't think I could. And I wouldn't want to. But you don't see any 400-pound guys on TV today. You, all, you They're all midgets. You know, they're all young, young kids, and they're tall and skinny. And, you know, it's like, what the fuck are they doing? You know, you need a yeah, killer no question there. about you, you need yeah, without it. question of a doubt, the business the business has really moved on a lot. You know what I mean? It's it's a completely different beast than what we were involved with. And we talk about the psychology. We talk about the other things that we were, uh, you know, that, that we were involved in. The learning from, uh, um, you know, just learning the business uh, from people like Finley and stuff like that. Um, it's it's uh, Finley, yeah, even Louis Sinclair. Grapplers, yeah, I mean, you know, the, you know the, I can name uh, I can name a lot of current names, you know, like you know Stone Cold Steve Austin, The Rock, The Undertaker. These guys, these guys are all great performers, but they're all great wrestlers too. You know, I mean, we can go in right. there and, and 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 put holes together and and make shit believable. You know, I've never had the privilege of working with Steve Austin, but I would have loved to work with him, man, because he looks like he lays that shit in. He's nice and snug. And that's the way I like it. Well, that's it, Mike. I did get the opportunity to work with uh, me, me and Austin had a few matches, tag matches and stuff like that. And I believe they, they got their start in Memphis, the Rock, and, and also because uh, that's when New York, I mean, in, in Austin as well, but Austin then went to Lobo and then came over to WCW. And, and when he came into WCW, we, everybody knew for me, that guy's going to, that guy's going to do something, you know, and uh, he, he was really, really smooth. His stuff was his stuff was tight. He was just, yeah, he was a good worker. And then when he found his niche with the Stone Cold uh, gimmick, boy, he took off, man, because he was doing that. What was he doing that? Uh, the Taskmaster, or what they call him? The yeah, I think master. that's what Taskmaster, or, you know, then he, you know, and, was and, doing the Stunning Steve gimmick, right? Well, he did the Stunning Steve in the WCW, but Taskmaster in WWF that just wasn't him. And when he got the opportunity to, to work, uh, do the Steel Stone Cold gimmick, it was just just perfect because all these guys in the past, great workers, Dusty Rhodes, Barry Windhams, uh, you know, I could name a few other guys that were doing the cowboy gimmicks that were kind of those long, lone wolf wrestlers that didn't, you know, didn't, you know, weren't heels, weren't baby faces. They were, you know, they were, uh, you know, they were outside the pack when they were doing their gimmick. Well, Austin, a lot of guys did weren't able to accomplish what Austin did with it. And Austin did it really well. But the one thing that really helped him out is he had the boss taking bumps for him. And yes. everybody wanted to stun the boss, right? The Monty and the Pharaoh Show is brought to you by... Because wine is your second favorite four-letter word. California wine, New York attitude, good fucking wine. Yeah. Not sure the shit out of the bus. Bus. Yeah, I mean, and who does the wanna... one? And that was work. That was ideal. Without, without Vince, I don't think Snow Cold, the, the gimmick would have got over as much as it did, but... You got to give Vince a lot of credit, but I mean, Steve deserves all the credit too. But 
but you got to give Vince a lot of credit for, for regardless of what you think of the man, you got to give the guy a lot of credit because that was probably the best movie he'd ever done. Yeah, and and who doesn't want to slap the shit out of their boss, right? I know fucking ten million fucking people that want to do that shit, you know. And and talking about the Rock, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but when the Rock started to before he hit the television in WWE as Rocky Maivia, he was up at the training camp in Stanford, Connecticut. And at the time, uh, myself and um, Kurgan and uh, Barry, we all were hitting the television doing the Truth Commission gimmick. So they brought us up yeah. from Memphis up to the office for the last two weeks before they put us on TV to go over the gimmick at the performance center up there and everybody could watch us and they could tell if they, we were ready for television. Well, when we got up there, the rock had just showed up at the same time. And so his first few matches in the performance center were against myself, Kurgan and my other partner, uh, Barry, uh, Barry uh, recon. And so, you know, we got to work with The Rock the first, you know, first probably five or six times. And, you know, it was good because we'd go in there and we, we would wrestle for two or three hours and basically taught him. And that's where that's when The Rock got started. And then like three, four months later, you seen The Rock on TV and then they changed his name and just to The Rock. And then, boom. He exploded. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but I mean, so, and it, but the thing is, is you could see the growth of the rock because when he first got on TV, you know, it wasn't he wasn't as impressive as he was. And a couple of years later, when they started calling him the Rock, and he changed up his image a little bit, boy, did he take off, dude! I mean, it was it was really good, man. He, he got into the uh, the business. He knew how to work the gimmick. He worked it well. And yeah, like I mean, you know, in, in the era of the, that wrestling. You got to say him and Stone Cold were were the best, you know. Um, to you know, they, they were the best for that time. Uh, okay, and then you had Undertaker, which was just an outstanding gimmick. Uh, but but Undertaker trans trans uh, he transgressed more because he was in there when when uh, when the man and Sean were on top too. You know what I mean? So Undertaker, what? How long was his career in New York? Thirty years or something like that? Yeah, uh, Mark long was, fucking uh, time, man. I mean, long, long time. You know, and Mark's a great guy, man. But you know what? I've seen him lately on TV or a couple podcasts here and there. And do you see how fucking old he looks, man? His fucking face and his skin is sagging. He's got bags around his eyes. You know, I was just talking to uh, Adam Bomb, Brian Clark, the other day, and. He brought that shit up, man. He said, have you seen the fucking Undertaker lately? I said, man, he looks like he's fucking like 95 years old. He said, yeah, man, he's got that fucking turkey fucking chin. He's got wrinkles everywhere, man. He says, um, they need to make him the fucking uh, masked man, but without the fucking well, gimmick this time. Well, if we, can get, if we get Mark to listen, man, I got a tip for him, man. Stop eating salad and get yourself a fat face. You'll smooth out all wrinkles. I don't have a single wrinkle on my face. <laughs> yeah, no shit, man. I'm, I mean, look at me. I'm 54. I think I right? might have one, right. maybe. You know what I mean? So, twisted, I mean, life is, twisted life steel is freaking and sex great. Appeal. Twisted steel and sex appeal is spreaded with a lot of butter. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, my secret is when I was growing up and I travel on the road, my mom used to use oil volet. And so I would always steal her oil right. volet and rub it on my face. Well, when I start uh, wrestling back and forth to fucking Germany, you know, they didn't have oil volet in Germany. So I would buy like eight or 10, 12 fucking bottles of oil volet and take it with me, man. I wasn't going to run out of oil volet, brother. And I think that's, yeah, that's I why you, man. I look, you know, it's worked I, out I so far. Charles, because I remember you open up your bag in the dressing room. And there'd be like five tubs of cork and five tubs of oil of ole. <laughs> and uh, for those of you that don't know what cork is, it's like uh, it's like a thicker yogurt. And uh, well, Mike used to eat that by the quart full. He just had to have a big tub of yogurt, and he'd sit down in front of my camper, and he used to eat a big tub of yogurt every morning. But hey, it was good, a lot of protein, right? Right, big guy. Yeah, man, it was it was great protein, and it was my favorite flavor, peach. 
And I ate the shit out of some fucking pork, man. I would go to the store and I would check out the fucking checkout line. I'd have 30 fucking containers of cork standing there. The guy says, are you going to eat all this? I says, well, not at once. <laughs> you know, but yeah. So speaking of cork, man, listen, we, you and me, we have it traveled your mic, all over. Your mic, mic. You and me have traveled all over the place together. And we spent a lot of time up and down the road um, wrestling. And, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from you, brother. We've been through thick and thin together. And we've always had each other's backs, man. You know, uh, I remember when Dave Finley got us to try out in Kansas City in, what, 2010 or 2011? Yeah. I was 2000, and, um, 2007. 2011, 2007. and and you know Seven. you and me, you and me both were in the best shapes of our lives at that time, and we went down there, man, and we tore the fucking house down, man, in front of everybody well, in the dude, afternoon. Well, dude, I mean, I just never forget that because we we ended up doing that tra that training and. Uh, we got there and everybody just ignored us when we got back there to catering. Nobody wanted to know who we were. They gave us, they, you know, and even the guys that I knew from England, like, uh, like uh, what's his name, Bulldog Jr. And, and all those guys, you know, the, the Canadian, the, the cavalry group, and they just, just ignored us like we were nobodies. Oh, and yeah, everybody. Family, I mean, as soon as I, Finley and Lincoln came in and threw, the, threw their arm around us and shit like that, Everybody wanted to know us. And then when we got out there and we performed in the ring, every wrestler in that venue for that for that raw, it was a raw, wasn't it? Every, oh, yeah. every wrestler in the venue was out there to watch us do our thing, man. You know, we could do that. We could got the opportunity to do that for the company. And I mean, I, I remember what uh, you remember what Layfield uh, said to Harley Race. Oh, when he when he said that uh, he had somebody that he wanted to get in there and, and work, and Laura Nida said, um, uh, "Harley, don't bother me right now. I got business to take care of with these two guys." And he off we said, fucking he went. Said, man. He said, "Harley, fuck." Tired of that same old, same old breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Same old tasting scrambled eggs, burger, that dinner steak ribs or pork chops why not add a little bit of spice or just a touch of heat to make the difference change that scrambled egg with a little bit of johnny fabulous's john cena seniors million dollar jalapeno hot sauce great on burgers steaks chops and those barbecued ribs <laughs> That's right, he sure did. I he, forgot about that. Goes, oh, oh, I'm talking right now. And then John says, uh, come on, uh, there's an office back here, we, we, you know, because it was in the basketball ring right there in KC. And uh, he said, come on, we'll go talk back there. And he said, he and I, I remember those was playing his day. Was, Listen, uh, what do you guys like working? You know, baby face. And he said, well, we, we'll work at him, but whatever, you know, whatever you want. He says, I think we're going to use you as heels. You know what I mean? Like we had a spot there, man. And then all the haters hated it. And, and you know, yeah, the guys. The guys you know, because you know, I mean, when we, we, we when we got the names, there, I don't care. But you know, well, when we got there, you know, I I worked for the company already, so everybody pretty much knew who I was, and you knew a lot of guys in the back. But you're right, man. Nobody fucking came and talked to us. They act like they've never met us before, and. uh you know, once Finley came up and put his arms around us, man, then we were like everybody's friend, right? It's like, well, fuck, if, if Dave knows these fucking guys, they must be okay. Well, yeah, motherfucker, you don't remember me? You know, we worked together fucking 20 times. You know, it's like, give me a fucking break. But we tore the, we tore the fucking house down, man. And, you know, all the fucking haters were hating. And we didn't end up getting the spot, you know. And um, the thing is, man, is... People have blocked you. People have blocked me. But one thing's for sure, nobody can block us now because this is our fucking platform. 
and we can say whatever the fuck we want to, and ain't nobody going to shut us down or tell us what to fucking do. Amen to that, man. I agree with that 100%, man. Hey, Mike, um, I know that uh, we need to move on and we need to talk about a few other things because we have a couple more agendas and we can continue on our next programming to talk about other things that we did in our past so that the people can get to know us. How do you feel about that? Should we uh, move on to the next segment or what do you want to do? Well, you know what? I'd really like to talk about this big upcoming fight that's happening uh, tomorrow in Saudi Arabia. Do you treat your dog as part of the family? <laughs> well, so do we. So why not celebrate your pup's birthday with the ultimate party box? Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Party Pup Info, and let us make your pup's party or any celebration perfection. Coming fight that's happening uh, tomorrow in Saudi Arabia between Jake Paul and Tommy Fury. Now, these are two guys. These are two guys that aren't known really for their boxing skills. You know, Jake Paul is a social media uh, standout. And Tommy Fury is Tyson Fury's brother. And Tyson Fury is the world heavyweight champion in boxing right now. And um, Tommy Fury hasn't really fought anybody. He's 8-0. He has four knockouts, uh, four split decisions. Jake Paul is 6-0 and uh, with four knockouts. So these guys obviously have some knockout punching power. Um, so, but, you know, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a pretty tough fight. I think it might go the distance because, you know, neither one of these guys have really fought anybody. You know, Jake Paul has fought Tyson Woodley two times, knocked him out one time and got a split decision um, the next. And he's also beat... Anderson Silva in the boxing ring. So he's beat some, he's beat some pretty good guys, you know, and, you know, Jake Paul's uh, brother, Logan, his little brother, Logan, he just started working for the WWE in the last year or so. And he's been doing some big pay-per-view shots for, for New York. So, you know, this, this Paul family has a lot of athletic ability in their bloodline. Hey, you know what? I mean, I mean, he's obviously uh, Jake Paul's obviously super tremendous at self promotion, um, and at his YouTube channels, his stats, and everything like that. But let's talk about a few intangibles, if you want to, Mike. Because I got, I'm looking here. I got uh, Jake Paul on boxing stats. I got Jake Paul. He's standing at six foot one. He's got a seventy six inch reach. I think he weighed in at like uh, one eighty three point something. And then on the other, on the flip side, you got uh, you got Tommy coming in there, and I think his intangibles. He's six foot tall, and he's about a pound heavier than uh, than Jake Paul is, and he's got about uh, four inches on on reach, which is nice. And I was looking at, but the thing is, is here's what's what kind of throws me off is uh, Paul. Okay, uh, Tommy Tommy Fury. He's been around boxing his whole life. His brother is the heavyweight champion in the world. Okay, why is it why is it taking him so long if he's so interested about boxing and stuff like that? And he's really his heart's into it. Why is it taking so long? Only 24, but still, shouldn't he have more than eight fights under his belt, as far as I'm concerned? I, I just don't know if his heart's in the game. However, I the one thing I found in the mirror today, I found it in the British newspaper, the mirror, they were carrying Jake Paul to Merriweather, not in his oh, boxing skills, not in, no his boxing skills. not in his boxing skills, like, don't, calm down, not in his boxing skills, but in business skills, because Merriweather always picked his fight, he knew what when to pick a fight, so now I was also looking at where, you know, what Vegas got, Vegas, Vegas has got Paul, um, he's a favorite to win this match, I believe it, Mike, Tyson, Mike Tyson's picked uh Paul to win the to win the fight, and uh, even Tyson Fury, uh, Tommy's brother, said, uh, "Hey, dude, you need to be wary of this guy." And I was watching some of the footage of the training and stuff. And here's here's the difference between the two: is I think Tommy's got uh, I think Tommy's got great feet, but Jake Paul got better hands. 
And I think yeah, Jake, Paul, Jake Paul, he's a better hitter, a harder hitter, and he's more about scoring points. Yeah, you know, Tyson Fury went on um, Fight Hub TV last week and said that he thinks that his, his brother Tommy is going to uh, get the victory over uh, Jake Paul. You know, he went out and said that, you know, he, he went out to uh, say as far as saying, listen, I think he can knock him out maybe. And I don't see that happening. I think I, I see this fight going the distance. Um, I don't see one boxer's skills um, overmatching the others um, to a great extent. I think it's a pretty even and well-balanced fight. And I think it's going to go the distance. I mean, um, I, I, I might be wrong. Uh some fucker might get knocked out in the first round, but I see I see the fight going the going the distance. Um, if so goes, listen, I, I, I believe I believe if it goes beyond four, I think it's it's all in Paul's favor. I don't think that I mean he's got the legs, but he's never fought for the four round. So, yeah, I mean that's something. Longer the fight goes, I think the, the more it goes into, into, into Paul's favor. Well, listen, you know we'll be talking about the winner of this Jake Paul Tommy Fury fight on a future podcast. So if you want to know who wins and to see who was right and who was wrong, well, you're going to have to stay tuned into SOB sports podcast. And we'll bring that uh, newsflash right to you as soon as we have it. So Paul, listen, I think uh, we've had a f- pretty good first show here today. Um, it's going pretty smooth. Um, we had a little technical fuck ups here and there, but you know what, we'll get all that shit worked out, man. Um, do you have any last words to say? Yeah, Mike, uh, I appreciate uh, taking time and getting into this venture with me. This has been a really a fantastic start. Uh, I think um, we got more to come, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with you and with Tim and uh, working with Manny and the Pharaoh in the future. And I know we'll pick up a lot of, a lot of people listening to our podcast in a big hurry because uh, we've, got, uh, we've got the material, we've got what it takes. And like you said, it's our platform to us. We can uh, we we can do whatever the hell we want to do. Yeah, you know, and you know, once again, you know, I can't stress enough how grateful we both are to be here today. You know, I'm grateful. I'm living the life in sunny Southwest Florida, um, just living it up. It's sunny and 85 degrees outside right now, and life is beautiful, man. I mean, I'm just down here living my best life, you know. And uh, I just want to remind everybody that. Um, us here at SOB Sports, we have a motto. And the motto is, you only live once. So I'm going to retract that. Our motto here at SOB Sports is you only die once, but you live every day. So go out there and have fun and enjoy life, everybody. Peace out.